she said that it looked like a rainbow and Jesus thanked her for being his friend and for loving him. I know I just I can't explain it and I'm just I'm just so grateful she's still here. When I found out I was pregnant, I was considered high risk because we had miscarriages before her. So around the 12 week mark, they did blood work and my genetic test showed that some of her markers were off. So when they did the ultrasound, they found the choroid plexus cyst in her brain, then also an EIF, which is a white marker in her heart. And those are also markers for genetic conditions. But since she didn't line up with the Down syndrome or the trisomy 18, they just wrote it off as a fluke. Around six months, she wasn't progressing. She wasn't rolling over. She wasn't holding her bottle. She was still essentially like a newborn. So when we went for her six month well check is when I brought it up to the pediatrician and the pediatrician was like, no, that's not normal. She had her first seizure. She was a little over two and she had spiked a fever and just started having the seizure. So we took her to the hospital. She was done having the seizure by the time we got to the hospital. And then from there, we had a few more instances where she would have seizures. They had put her in the hospital for a week to do an EMU study, which is the epilepsy monitoring unit because they wanted to rule out if the seizures were being caused from epilepsy. The next route to go was sleep apnea because her sleeping patterns were a little weird. So at that point, she referred us to the ENT to have her tonsils and her adenoids checked and they would go from there with her testing. We were comfortable, we were confident, we felt like this was gonna be the end all of her seizures and the medical issues, like this is gonna be the surgery to fix everything. <laughs> they pulled her out of anesthesia, she was in recovery, and they said everything was fine. The next few days, she was just laying around and really lethargic, so we didn't think anything of it. Six days after her surgery, I had walked past her room and she was playing. I walked past her room again and she was laying on the floor and just had blood like running out of her mouth. So we took her into our local urgent care where we lived. They had transported her up to the hospital. They have monitored her for a day and then sent her home saying that it was probably just a nosebleed from her surgery. Two days after that is when she came in our room in the middle of the night hemorrhaging. I knew I needed to stay calm. We knew we needed to get help. So we called 911, said that she was bleeding and they came. So one night I fell asleep on the couch watching a movie. It was like three in the morning and my dad just like hung up on a phone call. I was like, who was that? He goes, Zol Zola started throwing up blood. So I ran upstairs and like the paramedics were like taking her out. And then I went over in my mom's room and I'm like, what's going on? And then she was like telling me all about it. And then we both just had like a meltdown. And even after Zola's hemorrhage, Bryston slept on her floor for months because he was so worried about her. We ended up buying a trundle bed because he was sleeping in there so much. Like he was just worried. By the time we got to the hospital, it was almost like a movie. They rushed her into trauma. The doctor was talking to me, she had forms. Um, they weren't sure what was going on. They weren't sure what they were gonna find when they got her in, but they were like, just so you know, the blood is already in the waiting room for her ready. And we're gonna do everything we can to save her because her blood levels were so low at that point because she had been hemorrhaging for, at that point it was 10 days. She had been hemorrhaging internally. We were lucky that we caught it and we got our help when we did. It 
it is something even to this day that I still, I can't even comprehend. I was getting her ready and it wasn't even like we were talking about anything God related beforehand. We were just getting ready to go to gymnastics and she just asked, when can I see God again? It took me back and I kind of like chuckled like the same face I'm making now. And I was like, what did you, what do you mean? What'd you say? And she said, yeah, when can I go see God again? When did you see God, Zola? And that's what she said, on well, the night I died. And the thing is, she she never flatlined when she was in the hospital. So it really was just, I guess, a near-death experience she might have had, or he came to her to calm her and soothe her. So can you tell me what you remember from that day? Giving him a hug. At the time when she had said it, it was about five months after my older sister had passed away. At that time, we weren't really going to church. We weren't as invested as we had been. So for me, it was kind of like, wow, this is him coming through to my daughter. And my daughter is so convicted that it convicted something in my heart. Like, okay, you know, we need to go back to church. We need to keep following because he is here and he is with us. And Zola, do you still talk to God a lot? I had never actually known anybody that had one. Even when she said it, my first, I wasn't even thinking like near-death experience. I was like, oh, that's so amazing that you felt comfort and you saw him. You know, she said that it looked like a rainbow and Jesus thanked her for being his friend and for loving him. Taylor Stanlow syndrome, it's a genetic condition and it's rare and it affects the connective tissue in your body, primarily on the collagen. And then the affected areas are normally like your skin, they bruise easy, it's a lot of pain, a lot of fatigue. The condition itself is not life-threatening, but it has a lot of life-threatening complications. Zebras is the medical term for people with rare conditions. There's a saying that people are taught in med school that you look for horses, not for zebras, meaning you'll look for the common diagnosis, not the rare diagnosis. My parents tell me I'm a little bendy and that's why my joints hurt because I have a thing called EDS. The adults call it Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and it runs in my family. I really wanted to do something to raise awareness because we had never heard of it and we almost lost her. We just want to save lives, like that was the mission behind it. We want to push for kids to be diagnosed so they're not getting a diagnosis after something traumatic happens. I can't explain it and I'm just, I'm just so grateful she's still here.